Hi, I'm Martin Sadler, the editor of Rugby League Express, and this is the latest in our series of uh, occasional Zoomcasts um, on, on our website, totalrl.com. And I'm very pleased to say today we've got a, a very special guest, Lee Addison, who's an Englishman in, uh, in, in Australia, uh, more specifically an Englishman in Brisbane. And yeah. Lee is um, a coach. He's made a career as a, a rugby league coach in Australia, which is a great thing for an Englishman to do. But prior to that, he, um, he was a student rugby league player in this country who became a media manager for a, a couple of years at Wigan Warriors uh, before emigrating to Australia in 2007. And I think it's fair to say landing on his feet uh, and Lee, I think um, congratulations on your career. You've you've had Thank a you. great career so far in Australia, and long may that continue. Um, and you. I'd just like to um, ask you uh, to start with um, where you see rugby league's position in Australia now. You know, you, the, the NRL. You're obviously a a very interested observer uh, in, in a mm. number of ways. Um, and you know, what 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 do you see the state of the game? Has it fully recovered? Do you think from the um, uh, impact of COVID, uh, you know, from a couple of years yeah. ago? I mean, there's obviously quite a few uh, dimensions to that question, a few different ways of looking at it. I I'm just going to um, tell you one story that I think sums it up. In, in 2007, when I first arrived, I was scrapping around looking for part-time work. I did a bit of labouring, a bit of this, a bit of that. And the, the ARL development in the Manly area as they were then called, the ARL development, gave me a part-time casual job as a development officer. And um, at the time, I bought a car for about $1,000. It was a, a little Honda Civic rust bucket. Um, they gave me a bag of balls that was in a tarpaulin bag. You know the you know the old tar tarpaulin bags that yeah. look like the old tea towels? <laughs> yeah. we, had, we, had the, we had the old Steedens in there. I remember I had some... Uh, just my own clothing. It was, I think I had a kangaroo shirt or T-shirt, training T-shirt, something like that. And I went to a primary school and I had about 30 kids. Over the way from me, there were five kids doing something in the corner. But there were four staff with those five kids. They were decked top to toe in red Sydney Swans gear. Mm. They turned up in a red Sydney Swans branded car. They gave gifts at the end, and I thought they're doing it a hell of a lot better than we are. This was in 2007, Martin, mm. and I went back and reported my findings straight away, and the response I got back I think is indicative somewhat of where rugby league sees itself in this country. The response was, and I'm, I'm paraphrasing here, but it was basically AFL will never kill us around here. Yeah. Right? I would hate to go back to that school and do that job now because since that has happened there's two big AFL clubs in Sydney there's two big ones in in Brisbane everywhere you go Martin AFL is starting to really uh, infiltrate the school I've just left I've been a I mean you'll no doubt unpack this as we go on but I six months ago I left schoolboy rugby league coaching and me and the principal there we've worked together he used to be the deputy at my old school. We've worked together for a decade and we've been canvassing rugby league for things to help our academy. And I think there's an old saying that relates to um, doing something in the wind. Well, the AFL have come into that school, which is in the middle of Logan. They've offered a financial figure. They've offered to put floodlights in. And my old boss is finding it very hard to turn that away, and he's rugby league through and through. Oh, yes. Mm. They, 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 they've got their house in order, the AFL, and it's, it's part of their... I believe it's actually part of either their constitution or their mission statement that one of their jobs is to beat and crush all the other codes in Australia, and that was yeah. as far back as the early 1900s. So you asked me the state of the game. I think, I think we... As a sport, we like to focus almost too much on the positives when it comes to um, some of the things that stare us in the face. We, we, we're obsessed with being positive all the time. I'd rather be truthful. We've got, we've got teams in places like Logan and, and, and Brisbane where 
junior teams are struggling to put 13 players on the field and having to forfeit. I've never heard I've never heard as much of that ever before. Mm. Yes, I know I know we've got COVID in there, but AFL had to deal with COVID as well. Um, I th- I think Australian rugby league is there for the for the taking, not not from from somebody like England, Samoa, Tonga in World Cups because I just feel that it's not it's not the it's not the powerhouse that we thought it was 10, 15 years ago. Maybe maybe I'm maybe I'm living it too much. I don't know, but it's uh, yeah, so it's, it's a genuine threat. Itself. In other words, from from AFL, it, it it really is absolutely absolutely. Plus, of course, league's ability to shoot itself in the foot so often. Yeah. Um, I mean, you, you know, I remember growing up, Martin, that when Great Britain played on a, in a test match on a Saturday, there was no amateur rugby league that day mm. or that weekend. They cancelled everything. Everybody went down on the train to Wembley. Well, Brisbane Broncos, for example, played most of their game games on Friday night. Yet most of the juniors in Ipswich and Brisbane play their games on a Friday night too. So there's all these converted fans that can't go and attend the game. The, the, the rugby league is still very good at doing that over here. It's just that it's, oh, yeah. just, it's just it's just so much better in terms of numbers than it is in England that that sort of has a an organic um, what's the, what's the term I'm looking for an organic sort of uh, appearance an organic yeah. strength because because of the sheer weight of numbers. But I'm even telling you that I believe those numbers are under threat too. Yeah, yeah, that's really interesting. So. Um... Mm. So the biggest threat to Australian rugby league won't come from us or any other country, but from the AFL is what you're saying. Uh, ma- massively. Um, I, I do believe, and I'm sure this would be denied, but I do believe there is lots of, I'm not going to go as far to say that the figures are being uh, falsely claimed, but they're certainly, you know, you can look at and statistics. Being, being or you can look, yeah. yeah, they're being massaged. So, um, for example, I know stories uh, of players that were registered to a club in 2020. Their registration just carried over into 2021. If they didn't turn up at their club, they were still counted in the statistics. Mm, mm. The, the so that's one thing, example. The strange thing is, though, Lee, that, that rugby league on the field um, you know, looks pretty healthy, doesn't it? If you look at the... 16 NRL clubs, they, they appear to be operating pretty well. Their crowds are holding up reasonably well. And, mm. um, you know, you, you wouldn't, you, you, I mean, I wouldn't say everything in the garden is rosy, but it, mm. it, it doesn't look too bad, you know. And the TV viewing figures are, 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 are pretty good, as far as I can tell. Mm. So, you know, you'd think that they would have a lot to build on. But the trouble is, we're a sport that doesn't really invest in our future in the same way that you've just mentioned that the AFL does. Yeah. And that's the, I, that's the danger. Yeah. And I think all the statistics that you talk about are actually, most of them are heading South. Mm. Most, most of the KPIs are heading South. And again, it's how you massage the statistics. Mm. Uh, the, um, you mentioned playing t- standards, I think there in your, in your, in your, in your uh, overview. Mm. It wasn't that long ago, six months ago, we were talking about the gaps in the NRL. We were saying that, you know, the there's so many teams underperforming. If you look at the NRL last year, there was a massive difference between the top four, the team number five to eight, or maybe five to ten. Yeah. I remember I remember being at a Broncos and Bulldogs game, and I was honestly thinking to myself that they were both trying to lose the game. It it mm. it the standard of it was awful. Mm. And again, what I get frustrated about is what I sometimes see and hear coming from England. I think you've never had a better chance to beat Australia. And what, because what I'm thinking in my head is that Australian standards have just dropped ever so slightly, ever so slightly, ever so slightly. Mm. I look at it from a few perspectives. And one of the perspectives is that 20 years ago, if we're looking at international rugby league now, 20 years ago, there weren't as many Polynesian rugby league players playing in the top no. competition. No. And the and the ones that were probably aligned with Australia. Oh yes. When it yes. came to Test Match Rugby League. Mm. So so now if you think 50% of the NRL ish or 50% ish of the NRL is of Polynesian heritage or birth, that's now 
getting divvied up between New Zealand, Tonga, Samoa, Cook mm. Islands. Mm. I'm not so, I, part of my thinking is that maybe Australia aren't going to be the threat that they were. No, their, their depth isn't as great years. as it was. Their depth isn't, isn't as great as it was, is what you're saying. Absolutely. And I think, I think there's a few things in the last couple of decades that have masked it. So the Melbourne Storm and the uh, Smith, Cronk, Slater combination. I'd throw in English in there too. I mean, they are four players that could play in any era and would merit a conversation of being mm. the best of, best of that ever, time. Yeah. So I think they carried Australia a little bit and therefore and Queensland, Queensland, of course. Yeah. Now I think you, I, when I look at what Australia can pick in the number one and the number seven and six and whatnot, I think they've got to hand a massive thank you to a club such as Penrith. Mm. So take Penrith out of that equation, mm. what you're left with. You know, it's um, you take Manly as well. I mean, uh, Bozo, God rest his soul, came back to Manly a few years ago and really spent lots of time working on their junior development structures in terms of uh, how they were coached, how they developed, but also where they were recruited from. And I think the game over here is even more reliant on those clubs. And if they dip, mm. I mean, is it any is it any coincidence that Queensland are struggling to win series at the minute and the Broncos aren't travelling too mm. well? Mm. You know? Absolutely. I think la- you know, last season, I think the Broncos, the Cowboys... Sorry, two seasons ago, the Broncos, the Cowboys and the Titans were all in the bottom four or five. Mm. So I think it's heavily reliant on the clubs. Mm. Um, and there's always that conversation, isn't there, Martin, about club and international, you know? Uh, do clubs have too much power? Do the, do well, the I think the clubs do have too much. Enough? The clubs mm. do, have too, do have too much power in Australia and yeah. certainly have had in, 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 in England um, mm. until this realignment and i'm not quite sure how this realignment is is going to work to be, um, <laughs> to be honest about it uh, you know there's a lot to uh, a lot that still needs to be done to persuade us all i think that it, it will yep. be effective in um, managing the game more effectively um I, I i think any divorce so i always think about the super league war which was very uh, difficult on both sides and I think the quicker it's resolved, the more bargaining power each side has mm. and can always walk away from the table again. Mm. And I think the, the Super League war probably gave the clubs a bit too much power because... Yeah, well, I'm sure it did, yes. In, th- in theory, they could walk away some of them and start yeah. their own competition. And they well, I think that. it's the same in Australia. I mean, you know, the, the, the vast majority of the NRL's income, it seems to me, goes to the clubs mm. to boost their salary caps. You know, and I think... <laughs> um, you know, and, and, and therefore goes into the players' pockets. And there's an, an, an inadequate amount that's invested into the future of the game, as we've just been saying. You know, if, yeah. if, if all those, if every club in, um, in the NRL had to account for its development work, you know, mm. and had to put in the same sort of resources that you've been talking about with the mm. AFL, I think mm. the game would be in probably a better state in, in Australia than it is. And... What's absolutely crazy? I mean, I always think, why why don't more cricketers play just like Don Bradman used to? Hit the ball on the floor, don't try and hit it into the into the air. Uh, get some kind of corrugated iron or a shed, and, and just use a a stump and hit a golf ball. That's overtraining. Why don't more play? Why don't more cricketers train like that? Well, Matt, why don't more people try and do what the Melbourne Storm have done, which is mm. You know, the Melbourne Storm don't often get into tangles over players, which players mm. to sign. They don't pay overs. And the next thing, you know, Bellamy and his and his, and his his tribe have plucked out a kid from somewhere in Queensland or somewhere mm. in, Bush, in Bush, New South Wales. Um, the Roosters seem to have got their house in order in the last decade in that regard too. And there's a lot of my players that have been in Queensland and done fly in, fly out for the Roosters. So their tentacles are everywhere. Um the Canberra Raiders, um, the late great Peter Mulholland. I mean, uh, you know this. They say this six steps of separation wherever you are in the world. Well, to Pete Mulholland, I think, and in rugby league, I think there was 
one step or two step. He knew everybody. Mm. And he the amount of players up here that he knew about, he'd ring me and ask me about a player, and I just could not believe that he had that that player in mind and his yeah. tentacles were everywhere. No, you know, Canberra have been quite a reasonably performing NRL side over the years, the last few years. Why why so many clubs are still going for this boom and bust mentality? Maybe it's out of necessity. Mm. You asked, you, you mentioned COVID right at the start of this. The feeling over here was that a few clubs were really going to the wall. Another mm. two weeks of lockdown and some of them might not have been able to function that year. That's no. how close it was, I think. No. And that, and you know, you know, with any business being a, being, you know, a, a man who's been in business and doing a great job for so long that if your business can is is at risk of going under just because you've had a bad five or six weeks, then mm. it's probably it's probably not the most stable business. No, so. no, no. I mean, having said that, the um, the NRL did a great job in keeping New Zealand Warriors going. I think. Unbelievable. Because, you know, for yeah. them not to be allowed back into New Zealand for the last two years has been quite incredible, really. And I mean, I think they are going to eventually return in July to play games in, uh, That's in right. Auckland. But um, That's right. it's just astonishing, really, that uh, that they've kept going as they have and, and, and actually beat Brisbane Broncos at the weekend. At, at, <laughs> yeah, uh, in their own backyard. Stadium. Yeah, in Brisbane. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's right. I mean, to, to sort of, bring all that together. There's a great book by a guy called Dr. Hunter Fujak called Cold Wars. Are you familiar with that book, Martin? No, I'm not, no. Right. Um, remember that, Dr. Hunter Fujak, Cold Wars. He, he basically did his doctorate. How, how do you spell on... his second second name? Can you just tell F-U- me? F-U-J-A-K. Right, okay. After after this, I will send you a picture of the of the front page okay. and you can you can maybe post it. The um and I, you know, I've never met the guy. I'm not, I'm not on his payroll. But his book, I have never read a book that has encapsulated everything I've just been talking about so well. Um, and he analysed the four codes in Australia. Australia is very unique in that it has four winter oh, yeah. codes four that all compete codes, with each yeah. other. Yeah. And long story short, if I'm going to summarise this book to you, he academically proves um, almost beyond question why the AFL business model is better than all the three others. Oh, yeah, yeah. And if you read, if you read that, you will fear for rugby league. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's why. <laughs> yeah. Maybe that's influenced my... Uh, well, the thing my... about the, um, the, the AFL model is that it, the, the AFL retains a lot of power centrally and can direct its clubs, can't it? You know, right. it, it's it's got it's got a massive power as a governing body, and it can right. dictate where the money goes. Basically, um, I mean, I, 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 I've I've written before um, Lee about st- structures important. I, I used to be a, a lecturer, university lecturer, and one of my subjects was business organisation and finance. Yeah, and I used to lecture on business structures and saying basically that. Structure does matter. You, you, you can be successful even with a bad structure, even with a bad organisational mm, structure, mm, but mm. it's much easier to be successful if you've got the right structure. Mm, and mm, in mm. sport, I point to Major League Soccer as the um, best structure of all, because <clears throat> to cut a long story short there, what Major League Soccer does, and it's been, rem- I mean, I, I don't know if you know anything about Major League Soccer, but it launched in 1996, which was coincidentally the same year that, Super League launched, <laughs> and it launched with 10 clubs. In 2022, at the last count, it had 30 clubs or thereabouts. Yeah. Um, yeah. And it's because, you know, everything is determined centrally. The clubs yeah. are not totally unique bodies legally. The clubs are actually controlled by, yeah. the, by, by the central body. And that's yeah. so they can move resources around. So in other that's words, right. if they see a West Tigers who need some help to, you know, bounce back from a, a you know, a poorer year. Or oh, they'll be gone, yeah. They, they, can, they can put resources into that club. Um, you know, they pay all the player salaries centrally, for example. So, so, so no team can hoard players and, and many yeah. other things. I mean, there are a lot, a lot of yeah. reasons why they're, they're so effective. Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but, but it, 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 it is important, you know, that 
you know, get the right structure. And, and I'm hoping, I mean, yeah. <clears throat> we've got the, um, <clears throat> the RFL and Super League coming together, looking for a, what they call a strategic partner, mm -hmm. which we all think is going to be the IMG group. And mm -hmm. I'm, I'm hoping that that partner will look at our sport, look at its structure, and then, you know, tell, tell the clubs, tell the RFL, look, this is how you need to be organised if you're going to be successful, if, you know, if, if you are going to grow. Because we can't, we can't stay as we are. We, we, we were 12 clubs in 1996 in Super League. We're 12 clubs 26 years later. It's, it's not a record of success, is it? Let's face it. So, and the, crowd, the crowds aren't necessarily heading crowds, in the right direction. No, the crowds are not rising significantly. Um, it, 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 and, and yet they should be, and it should be easier to, 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 to sell this, this sport because I'm a bit like you. I, I, I think I'm a good judge of sport, and I think rugby league is the, um, the, the best sport of all. Mm. But mm. there's not much point in that if the vast majority of the public don't agree with us. Is there really... When that's right. The when I when I look at the the British rugby league journey again, being a coach, I sort of look at it through the prism of player development. And I, if you look at it from a marketing angle, I firmly believe people want to go out and watch stars. They want to see talent. Mm. So therefore, they're they're intrinsically linked because you develop the best players. People will want to watch them and give them. And a I was file. that's right. And the I was. When David Way ran the world class performance plan for, for British Rugby League back in the late nineties, early two thousands, I was a coach in that system, sort of two thousand and two to two thousand and four. And I don't know what your memory is like, Martin, but England actually beat Australia at under eighteens level for mm. the first time ever mm. around about that time. I think it was two thousand and two. Yeah, with um, some of those young Leeds players who you know. That's own. right. Maguire and those sort of guys were involved That's right. at that time. That's right. And so what we've now got, we went through, the, through a phase where England or Great Britain, whatever they were packaged in, would, would topple Australia at 18s quite regularly, even though it's not always an apple and apple because the academy is sometimes... Um, there's some older players sometimes playing for the academy, hasn't they, over the years? There's been some 19 sometimes play against 17s in the mm. Aust Australian schoolboys. But the fact of the matter is we never used to beat Australia at schoolboy level. And then all of a sudden it started changing. That, to me, suggests that sort of five to ten years after that, you should start to see a different place on the podium if you're a national side. Now, exactly. as a Nate. As a nation, Great Britain or England, we've, we have, have invested so much into sport ahead of the 2012 Olympics. And so many of our, our sporting teams or sporting individuals went from being nowhere near to being on that podium. Um, even the cricket team managed to get the ashes after 2005 at least a few times. Um, What's rugby league achieved in that time with the with the offerings that it had? I mean, it's yes, it's achieved some junior successes, but throughout my lifetime, England or Great Britain have never beaten Australia in a series, mm, mm. and I think it's over half a century now. Well, you know, I always used to say that um, I'd never retire from running League Express until mm. England win an international tournament or Great Britain win an international tournament or, mm. or win the World Cup. But I think I might have mm. to. If we don't win it this year, I might have to uh, <laughs> change, change that view. Well, you, you, you nearly I'll, I'll be going on till I'm 100 if I'm not careful. You, you nearly had a chance last year when the World Cup nearly went ahead without Australia. Yeah, well, indeed. You yeah. Could... <laughs> yeah. I think, actually, having it, had it postponed has been a blessing in disguise um, lead uh, this year. And, you know... How do you see the World Cup unfolding? I mean, obviously, Tonga are going to be a massive challenge, but Samoa are surely going to be a massive challenge for England in that first game at, uh, at Newcastle. In Absolutely. October. And I go back to what I mentioned earlier, and I think COVID has changed our, our lives in so many ways. I mean, um, and I think it's, influ it's influenced athletic performance hugely. 
Um, I certainly looking at some of the Super League games in the middle of the last year after I think what might have been the third lockdown or mm. <laughs> or the lockdown or the year before the the preseason preparations and the in season preparations just weren't the same. And looking at it purely from a athletic performance point of view, I do feel that the Australian game is ahead in that sense. And and over here in the NRL. They've had their first proper off season since God knows when. They've not had to go to a World Cup. There's been no mm. origin after the season. Players have had surgeries that they never had chance to have before. Meanwhile, in England, they're still having the usual couple of weeks off before they have to go back to pre-season to play yes. maybe a friendly on Boxing Day and start the competition a month early. And, Ridiculous, and isn't it? It is absolutely ridiculous. And I think when you talk about Samoa and Tonga and the like, don't forget a lot of their players are part of this NRL system. So oh, yeah. I think they're going to come over fresher. I think they're going to come over more athletically prepared, whether it's in their heart or not, some of them. Um, certainly Tonga, Samoa, if they get on the on the plane and go over, they will give everything they can to the cause because it means so much to them. We do know... I don't know, again, I mean, I don't know if people have, have tended to forget this, but I, I remember looking at an England versus Australia test match. I forget the year, but it was about eight or ten years ago. And England were playing against Australia reserves. Mm. And it was in Australia. The players were pulling out left, right and centre because they didn't care. Their care factor was was a lot less. I do feel with COVID and with restrictions for the last couple of years, I do feel that Australia are going to make a bit more of an effort. I think players will want to get over and because they've had it taken away from them for a couple of years. Mm. So how do I see the World Cup? Unfortunately, I think it's going to go the same way as it always has. I think Australia will win the, will win the thing. Who joins them in the final, though? I have a real, real uh, problem trying to, trying to decide who that will be because I, I just see... England, Tonga, and Samoa is having every chance of beating each other now. Well, you look at Samoa, and you know you've you've got a, a player like Jerome Luai, the Penrith mm. halfback, who mm. who seems to be resisting Mal Meninga's overtures to play for Australia. Mm -hmm. um, and I think if he continues to do that, uh, and I'm sure he probably will, then a lot of other Samoan players will will go the same way, won't they? They'll play. Absolutely. You know, Samoan heritage players will want to play for Samoa. And actually, yep. you look in our country, and, and one of my favourite players this season is Mason Lino, the halfback at Wakefield Trinity. Mm -hmm. um, and he's, of course, Samoan as well. You know, yep. a, a, a combination of Lino and Luai. There are probably other Samoan halfbacks as well in, in the yep. NRL, I've got no doubt. But a combination of Luai and Lino would not be a bad um, start to putting a team together, would it? No, and if you know, if if fifty percent of the NRL give or take a few percent is Polynesian, then it just stands to reason that Tonga, Samoa, they're not going to lack no cattle. They're not going to lack cattle. Um, on the flip side, I remember getting very frustrated with the British game or the English game when I read stories that Shay Sean Wayne was getting refused players for that All-Stars game last year and oh, some yeah. players were getting dragged over from All-Stars to England or England to All-Stars or whatever it was. It, it's it just... was pretty chaotic, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, sh you know, Sean Wayne needs the time with his squad. Mm. Um, I think Wayne Bennett, when he was the coach of England, and again, I could go off on another tangent here, the way that was all handled and... If you want to go down that avenue, please let me know. But I think when Wayne Bennett came in and said, I want this, I want this, I want this, his gravitas in the game meant that the English powers that be had to budge a little bit more mm. than they would normally. I just hope Sean Wayne can get that same respect because, so because you do need time with your squad. Our players need rest. I mean, from from a performance point of view, Martin, they... They play basically a month before the NRL, so they're already playing. They're already bashing each other. Um, and they invariably finish their grand final. Yeah. Have their grand final a week after the NRL grand final. So um, none, none of this lends itself to performance. So I just hope that the clubs give 
Sean Wayne a bit of something. What that looks like exactly, I don't know. But um, all the things I read uh, building up to what would have been last year's World Cup weren't too weren't too pleasing. They weren't too... Uh, I wasn't looking at it thinking, yeah, England are going to give this a real shake because they're having a great preparation. I never once thought that. Yeah, I no, that. no. I mean, it's got to be the number one objective for everybody in rugby league in this country to win the World Cup this year because the effects of doing so would be potentially incredible, wouldn't they? You know, if we, if we, do, if we do manage to do it um, mm. and we're then able to take advantage of that success, which again is another mm. question mark because... You know, we're not noted for being able to take advantage of of, of uh, great things that sometimes happen, but at least the potential is there. But, you know, and um, as you say, whether Sean will get the cooperation he needs is remains to be seen, I think, um, Lee. I, 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 th- I think English success in a World Cup would be the shortcut to get the game where it thinks it wants to be. Yeah. Especially if that is coupled with terrestrial television coverage. Sure. sure. So um, I think it was you who taught me this back in the day that Fleet Street, as it was then known, um, would be far more interested in seeing the word England or London or mm. some other big name, to, you know, big city name, than they are Wigan and Batley. And, you know, that, that stands to reason. I think it's still part of our mindset today. And I think people are, Younger people in particular, they have shorter attention spans. So something like a World Cup that happens over only a few weeks, yeah. England having success in that could build so much momentum. Would count for a lot. And, can you know, wouldn't you just love the powers that be in the game? And by, by the powers that be, I'm talking about every club CEO and chairman and who and not just the RFL, but wouldn't you just, and the Super League, wouldn't you just love them to sit down and think like that? Oh God, you know, yes! If only you know, they would. Like if, 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 if only they would. Look, let, let's come on to you. I'm not quite sure how, mm. much, <clears throat> how much time we've got left, but I, I, I do want to just focus on what you do now, because mm. you've got your own um, business as a rugby mm. league coach, and you actually mm-hmm. got a, a website called rugbyleaguecoach.com.au, and I believe you're coming over to England um, in a few weeks' time to do some That's coaching right. over here. So, so. Tell us a little bit about about that and um, and what you're anticipating doing when you get over here. Um, a few years ago, I was a bit frustrated with where my own coaching career was at, and I was also a contributor to the old rugby league coaching magazine, which you'll remember, Gary Roberts. Yeah. Um, I, I I used to buy that as a young kid, growing young coach growing up, and started contributing and uh, and whatnot. And it gave me the inspiration to do something similar because because I felt that the game was lacking the the resources, the books, the online resources, uh, journals from from academ- academia. I felt the game was lacking so much in terms of resource. So I basically locked myself away for six months and produced a website, which is like a Netflix for coaches and players and, and S&C coaches. That has since led on to coaching people in person because what happened during COVID, even over here where the the impacts of COVID were a lot less than in England, parents wanted their kids to have one-on-one coaching, small group coaching, whatever the rules allowed. So I went from doing one-on-one small group and then I, as soon as I was allowed, I started doing clinics. So I now host uh, clinics all around well, I'm going to be doing it all over the world, Martin. If you, <laughs> the um, uh, since the turn of the year, I've I'm going to have done twelve clinics by the time I arrive arrive in England. Um, mm. I've just I've just done a pre season uh, series of clinics in southeast Queensland. Coached about 350 kids uh, at five different venues in southeast Queensland. I'm now doing holiday clinics. I'm still in my uniform. I've been running a clinic today in Brisbane's Bayside. I start one in Logan tomorrow. I start one on the north side of Brisbane next week, and then I fly to Melbourne to deliver a clinic there. Right. A couple of days there. Do they have many kids playing rugby league in Melbourne, by the way? Because obviously that's uh, an outpost for Australian rugby league, isn't it? 
yeah, I don't know the exact numbers, but I would expl- I would I would I would I would describe Melbourne as sort of a oh maybe like a Hunslet compared to Leeds kind of thing in terms of mm. in terms of its size and or mm. maybe a I'm trying to, I'm trying to think how you describe it, but there's hardcore people there. The difference is they're all dotted around. Mm. So there's not you know, it's not like England where you have the M62 corridor where they're all, they're all sort of dotted around Melbourne. Mm. So I do a couple of days there and then I do three in Sydney, three-day clinic in Sydney, and then I'm straight on the plane to the UK. Mm. And that's mm. where, yeah, that's why we've been And where are we doing clinics in the UK? So Portico, Portico Vine Panthers. I'm doing a three-night clinic there. I'll be assisted by Vinnie Webb, the old uh, coaching guru, and Chris Ratcliffe, the Wigan Warriors women's coach. We're doing a three-night clinic there for four players. Mm-hmm. I've already had bookings and interest from both sides of the Pennines. And then that's uh, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, 25th, 26th, 27th of April, uh, 6 to 8 p.m. And then on the Friday, I'm hosting a, a coaching seminar at Saddleworth Rangers. And already I've started taking bookings for that. It's basically only a tenner for anyone who wants to, wants to come and have a pint with a, with a POM who coaches in Australia. And I'll be hoping to share a few tales about uh, some of the coaching I've done over here and where I think we're going wrong as British people. And I did try and get a Yorkshire venue, but it just happened a little bit too late. So next time I come over, I'm coming over to Yorkshire. Do you come over very frequently back to England, by the way? Yeah, um, basically at least every sort of Christmas holiday period. Um, there was a long time there where I didn't just... Just couldn't do it. Either I was too busy or whatnot. And my first trip back was with the USA when I was assistant coach of the Tomahawks for the 2013 World Cup. Really? Fantastic. And we stayed in a hotel in Warrington and literally a stone's throw away was my auntie and uncle. And I got all my washing done and all the neighbours were wondering <laughs> why there's all this all this USA Tomahawks gear on the washing line. <laughs> yeah. And, and, I, and I, I do remember the, the S&C guy, Ben Kelly, he gave the players a gluten-free diet, and after two or three days on this, I just started sneaking out to my auntie and uncles and getting a, <laughs> getting what I would say was a real feat. So <laughs> that might explain a few things. <laughs> <laughs> what was it like playing in uh, Bristol, by the way? That incredibly memorable game against Cook Islands. Oh, it was great. It was wet, and um, Terry Matterson was the coach, and I was the assistant, so I was downstairs on the on the earphone. So I was getting nice and wet while his, his bald head was nice and dry up top. I remember the crowd. I remember coming over and thinking, geez, this is a lot better than I thought it would be the whole world cup. But then there were other things that seemed to let it down to like the lack of quality TV coverage in and around it. But I remember being at Bristol and the crowd was great. I had family and friends there because they'd not seen me for so long. And we'd already beaten France in a warm-up game. So mm-hmm. confidence was high. Confidence was high. Pressure was zero. I don't know if you remember, but the the, the organisation committee of the tournament booked America's flights back for the end of the group stage. Mm-hmm. They never expected them to get to... They actually booked the flights. <laughs> right. And that was used as motivation. Yeah. No, but nobody had any hopes or any thought that USA would even win a game. So there was no pressure. And that was a magical elixir. It was a magical combination because the players just enjoyed themselves. It was a group of players that weren't too silly behavior behavior wise. Mm. There was no behavior issues. Um, and I'm not just saying that. It, it was true. They, they were just a, a lovely set of players that were really calm and just enjoyed each other's company they weren't didn't have to go out on the tiles every two minutes and one thing just led to another we turned France over in the in the warm-up game we celebrated like we'd won the World Cup that night I'll be honest um I'm sure the French looked at it a little bit differently but after that it just it was just like a a a ball that just kept rolling and Mm. um the only mistake I think we made and this will bring a few things together. We played Scotland at, at Salford in the third game. 
And I honestly believe that we should have maybe played a few of the players that hadn't played on the tour, give them a game mm. in that game. Because mm. When I look back at that game, a couple of players just looked a bit tired in the legs mm. because they were playing games every four days. Back yes. then. Um, and I just think it knocked a bit of the stuffing out of the boys. And then what happened was we went to, we had a nine day gap then to before we played the Kangaroos. And because they're not predicted us being there, we ended up in the worst hotel, I think, in Wrexham, the, the worst one they could have found us. I remember rooming with somebody, and I think they, I felt like I was almost right next to them because there was no room. <laughs> yeah. um, Kelly McGill, one of the assistant coaches, and we, we had some time off, and I think I'm, we just lost our momentum then, and we probably didn't put up the best show against Australia, but, no. you know, but for, to be there on the sideline and Cooper Cronk running round in seven. Oh, sorry, Jonathan Thurston, Cooper Cronk, Billy Slater at fullback. It was a it was a great day. I mean, for me as a coach, it was a, it was a great day, even though the result didn't suggest. No, that. that's marvelous, isn't it? Yeah. So, uh, in terms of um, these sessions that you're going to do over here, people obviously are going to be quite interested. I think in in mm. coming along. How do they register to um, to to get involved? Well, you, you've mentioned the website already, rugbyleaguecoach.com.au. The, 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 the programme is called the Aim Higher Programme, and there's a link to that right on the homepage as soon as you go. So as soon as you go on there. So rugbyleaguecoach.com.au, click on Aim Higher, and then scroll through the venues and they'll see the English, the English content there. Now, the other thing is, because I'm on Facebook, they can follow me, Lee Addison, on Facebook. They can just send me a message or send me a message through the Rugby League Coach facebook page and i will direct them um yeah getting really good feedback mate i think um you know having coached in australia for so long coached at a couple of nrl clubs and, and the like um there's a lot there's a lot we can learn as british people still about about how they do things over here i think it's just so much more part of the dna over here even though i do worry about the state of the game you still go in most staff rooms and most people know what the results were from the weekend. Yeah. Yeah. Ask every, you know, ask seven, ask 10 people, seven of them will have an NRL team mm. or eight of them will have an NRL team that they follow. There was a genuine excitement a few weeks ago because the football was returning back. People were talking about it in my circles quite a lot. Yes. And I don't necessarily spend all my time in rugby league circles. So you know, there was a genuine excitement, and it's so it's still part of the, still part of the fabric here. It really is. But like I said at the start of the thing, it's under massive pressure. Do you think, actually, though, having said that, just returning to that theme, that um, mm. I mean, you've you've mentioned already there are four major codes of football in Australia. Mm. The other mm. two, apart from the AFL, of course, are rugby union and um, and football or mm. association football. But those two codes, those two latter codes, seem to be struggling much more, don't they? Rugby union seems to, um, its crowds are well down, its TV audiences are, you know, declining sharply. Mm -hmm. Football is the same. The A-League in football is, is, it doesn't seem, it doesn't look to me to be doing well, even though it's had a massive private equity investment that was announced a few months ago. Um, it, it's, it's, you know, it, it, it did have a much higher profile than it has now. So although Rugby League may not be doing very brilliantly in relation to AFL, it certainly seems to be doing a lot better than those two codes. Totally, totally agree. And I, I, I don't know enough about the ins and outs of what is actually going on in union and soccer association football to know why their system isn't presenting itself as being quite as strong. I will say this, though, that for the last... 15 years in Australia, I've coached some of the best kids in this country. Um, I can rattle off names. Um, Feel free to do so. I'd be very interested to know who. Well, well, I'll name one from pretty much every year. As soon as I arrived my first year at Manly, I ended up at Manly Sea Eagles and Kieran Foran was in the SG ball team that I was assistant coach of. 2008, I had William Hopawati in my Harold Matthews team. 2009, Clint Gutherson was in my Harold Matthews team, the current Parramatta captain. 2010, I had a fella called James Tedesco walk up to me from the wing in training and say, sir, can I have a go at 5'8", five, five, standoff. 
and that year changed everything for him and, and he'll admit that and I'll see him in a couple of days actually and remind him um, <laughs> 20, 2011 Adam Elliott who plays for the Raiders now and used to play at the Bulldogs um, 2012 was a bit of a quieter year and 2013 uh, I um, started a new academy at Ipswich so the, we were essentially a third division team but then 2014 I had um, Philip Sammy from the Gold Coast Titans in my school side. Yeah, good player. Um, Ronaldo Molotalo was coming through 2015. Uh, 2016, the name that jumps out there would be Tremaine Spry, who's at the Gold Coast Titans. Um, and then at my last school, again, there was a setting up period. Uh, there's an Alex Leopi, who's a name you're going to have to watch out for. Um, I've seen he, that name already, yeah. Yeah, his dad was a, a heavyweight boxer and a boxing champion. And his son is a very good boxer too and very good rugby league player. He's already signed to the Roosters. So there's just a few names I just rattled off off the top of my head. But, you know, yeah. it can go on. And, and so, so my point being was that I've coached some of the best kids in, in the game. I'm, I'm looking now, there's some pictures on my wall. I could, I could <laughs> But... Um, um, I've never once heard of rugby union being in for them. Mm. Not once. Because mm. 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 I, you know, being involved in the game over here and the business of the game, you hear the managers talk and blah, 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 the agents. And I can't, you know, I don't I don't remember James Tedesco being tapped on the shoulder by New South Wales Waratahs or No, no. You know, and I think I, from what I can gather, there was a bit of an unwritten rule the league scouts should stay away from union schools and union patches and mm. vice versa. But what I also believe is league basically have just ignored that over the years. Union have tried to stick to it. And before, b- before they could do anything about it, the momentum shift was, well, was What they already... tend to do in union though, uh, Lee, is if they spot a, a promising player, and this goes back a long way as far as the Ella brothers, for example, <clears throat> they would give them scholarships, wouldn't they, to GPS yeah. schools? That's right. Yeah. <clears throat> and and those are the elite schools in Sydney. Mm. And mm. they, you know, the sort of St. Joseph's, King's School, those, those mm-hmm. sort of places. Mm-hmm. And they would play rugby union for their school team. And then they'd try they'd encourage them to go on to play for, you know, the, the clubs in the shoot shield, perhaps Randwick or somebody like that, uh, and then play for the Waratahs. So, right. you know, that and that system is still in place, actually, isn't it? They still do that and, with players. And, and he, he's Joseph basically Su- a private Joseph school Suali or was, nothing. Joseph yeah. Suwali was one of those kids who's come back to the Roosters now. But, um, you know, that he, he was, you know, given a scholarship. And um, I think he was at, was it St. Joey's, if I remember rightly? I think um, so, yeah. The, 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 the Roosters have sort of nicked him back, so to speak. Yeah. Yeah. The the private school system is still very much the rugby unions pot to pot to fishing kind of thing. Very much their pond to fishing. They um, but league has players in that too, and I know there are a couple of NRL clubs. I won't name them, but they actively put their players in rugby union schools because they don't want them to go to a rugby league school and do three times as much training. Mm. And they want they they back their own system. So I just think rugby union. I mean, just in Brisbane. The last anecdotal chat I had about their development officer situation in Brisbane, uh, one on the north side of Brisbane and one on the south side. One. Mm, mm. <laughs> that's not that's a lot. A, that's, a, that's a big job, isn't it? My goodness. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, um, so you're right there. Um, so, yeah, rugby league's doing all right. Uh, you know, and this frustrates me when... When the English game isn't doing everything it can to make the England team as good as it can, it's probably never had a better chance. No. Because Australia's talent has sort of been diluted, if you like. If you, got, if you think of Australia's talent as being the NRL and a few Englishmen in there... It's now going to be serving it, about five, it's dilu- five nations. It's diluted. In the yeah, World that's Cup. right. Yeah. That's right. So, I mean, I think back to that 2000 World Cup. And if you looked at the Australia 1-17 to and compared them to some of the teams that have trotted out since then, I think that 2000 World Cup Australia side was, was phenomenal 1-17. to mm. 
a couple of those players ended up playing in the 2003 World Cup in Rugby Union after, mm. after, after that World Cup. The, um, the, so the, the standards are sort of dropping there. And I, 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 I sort of briefly mentioned it before. It probably doesn't take as much as we think it will. I was at Suncorp Stadium 2017 when we were uh, an ankle tap away from possibly oh, yes. winning the World Cup. Yes. By the way, talking about Brisbane, how do you think the Dolphins will go under Wayne Bennett? Do you think they're going to be a success? Watching NRL 360 or was it 100% footy, um, Gus Gould basically said Wayne Bennett is smiling in the sense that he's recruited players, he's got deals, so they're going to be OK. Wayne Bennett's stocks as a coach, in my opinion, have never been higher. There are people who doubt, obviously, one or two things, but the reality is he's so well respected in the game and there's players going for conversations with him, going for cups of coffee that probably shouldn't be going for cups of coffee. Caelan mm. Ponga was the big one that was mentioned this week. And I do believe they're going to be a force. I, The choice of Redcliffe, I think, was a sensible one in the sense of TV viewing figures, so therefore cash. I do worry about teams like the Broncos, though. The Broncos haven't won a competition since the Titans came into it. No, <clears throat> no. But that um, there will be a lot of competition now in Queen. There will be four queens and teams now, won't there? Yeah, which, yeah, yeah. Which you know g- gives a lot of um, a lot of local derby type rivalries. I think. There, yeah, which you yeah. think would be a benefit to the game. My my perception of uh, I did six years in Sydney. And then came up to Brisbane. And my perception of, of Brisbane is that compared to Sydney, it's not quite as structured in its coaching ways and it's still discovering its rugby league love. Mm. Whereas Sydney feels a little bit like the old rugby league world in many ways. It's it's old structures, it's old, old boys network, it's very structured in a lot of its coaching. It feels like that sometimes, that you put a game on in Sydney and the equivalent fixture in, in Brisbane or somewhere in Queensland. And I think seven or eight times out of ten, the Queensland game will generate more fans. Mm. Um, and I think in Sydney, there's just possibly too much more for other people to do. There's a lot of different people from different cultures that wouldn't even know what a steed and ball does no. or what rugby league is, you know. Um, so from that point of view, choosing Redcliffe, was a great thing because there's many people think this is the heartland of rugby league now, but it's just not getting serviced in the, in the right way from the, the powers that be. You look at the TV shows, you look at the, the head office, it's still all in Sydney. It's still Sydney centric. Oh yes. And they sometimes have the Tolkien Queenslander on. But the good thing about the dolphins is that the Redcliffe club is very financially secure. Isn't it? Yes. You know, they, yes. They uh, they've got a lot of money in the bank basically, and mm-hmm. you know they can mm-hmm. they can afford to run a team, which I think is quite important. You know, there's 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 probably very little doubt about whether they'll, you know, go under in the same way that the South Queensland Crushers did back in yeah. the nineteen nineties. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the South Queensland Crushers, and yeah. um, the those were the days. I remember, yeah. you know, I used to, I remember back then. I mean, I I was only a kid really, and I just thought there was some good vision there, but whether it was thought out enough is another probably, matter, probably isn't not. it? Probably not. Anyway, look, yeah. we, we, we'll, we'll have to bring this to a close, Lee, because I think yeah. we're running out of time. So um, can I just end by thanking you for uh, joining me today? And I hope to see you when you come over. How long are you over here for, by the way? Um, basically two weeks, because I've got to come back and, and do some work over here. It's, it's uh, I mean, I've not seen a lot of family for a couple of years, so I yeah. had to get over. Yeah. Um, but you know, reality's biting. I've got to get back. I've got my roadshow continues when I come back. I'm going going out around different parts of Queensland then. So that sounds great. Well, I look forward to hopefully yeah. seeing you when you're over here. But thanks very much for joining me today. And I um you know, we'll be putting this on on, on the website. I hope people enjoy watching it. Thanks a lot. Thank you.